are high and lifted up. Archbishop Dominica Bierman has traveled the world for over three decades proclaiming the gospel from Zion to the nations with miracles following. She exposes the false doctrines of replacement theology and preaches restoration to the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Besides blowing the shofar here towards those buildings, right? Amen. What I want us to do is a summary of what we've seen in Jerusalem and what we've done in this tour. So as I'm standing here in the southeast part of Jerusalem and we see this whole construction of the new face of Zion's view or North Zion. Behind you, you have the old neighborhood and before you are the new buildings that as I said, it was a total miracle. It was two very rich people that decided that they needed to buy these lands because they belonged to uh, some um, Arab family. The Arab family was going to sell it. And they agreed to quickly buy this land, all this land where the buildings are being built, to make a second phase to Zion's view. Now you understand why it's called Zion's view? Because you have the Mount of Olives and you've got, from this side it's a little bit far, but actually if you go to the first building where the watchman apartment is going to be, then you can actually see very clearly the Temple Mount in front of you. But you can see from here Mount Zion, the Dormition, you can see the walls of Jerusalem, you can see uh, basically everything from here all the way and then you can see the Mount of Olives you can see the cemetery of the Mount of Olives uh, far below you can see the city of Siloam that goes all the way to the Gihon Springs and to the city of David so you know this this location is priceless it really is priceless but because let's put it that way not many people venture to live here it can be precarious, but it doesn't have to be, especially not if we're praying. It doesn't have to be. Uh, but the people that normally would be attracted to places like this that are on the edge, because this is on the edge. It's not on the edge of the promised land, because that's from the Nile of, to the Euphrates, but it's on the edge of the state of Israel of today. It's on the edge. People that are attracted to live here, they are normally religious Zionists. They, like the people that we met in Samaria, they have the guts and the faith to be able to settle everywhere we are allowed to settle, establish everywhere we are allowed to establish, even if that means that it's a dangerous zone, let's put it that way. And so the people that have been attracted to here are young, religious, Orthodox, Zionist families with lots of children. That was the first phase. Now the second phase, it's more expensive than the first phase. The first phase was a bit cheaper. Not a bit, quite a bit cheaper. It's like if you didn't have money, then you could buy on the first phase, like 12 years ago, something like that. And you could get a home for your family compared to the prices in Jerusalem, in, in the rest of the city it may have been like maybe a third of the price. And then the second phase came, and the second phase was going to be more developed. It's going to be more beautiful, let's put it that way, more expensive to build. And we are in different times as well. This is an Arab house right behind us, and all around us is all Arab neighborhoods. Two Arab neighbors, major ones, Siluam, as I said, going all the way to the Gihon Springs, and Jabal al mukabar it's all around this. So the people that began to be drawn here, even though it, it's open for everyone, they didn't close it, like for example, Shavei Darom, where we went to see our olive trees, right? And when we talked to the, um, to the administrator of the, of the village, right? He said, I asked him, and I said, so who can come and live here? 
and he said uh, only religious Jews can come and live here. So secular Jews are not allowed to live there. Contrary to that, Novcion is open to anybody that wants to buy an apartment while they give absolute preeminence to those that are religious Zionist Jews. And so, but there's already three secular families living here, which wouldn't be on the first phase, but it is on the second phase. So it's opened up a little bit more, and also because they're also making something much bigger, and because they also want to make money. And so when we came here and we liked the place, and we looked at it, um, not only liked the place, it was just beyond us liking the place. It was like it was divinely appointed to be. That's the way it is. Um, then, you know, we asked them, and we said, do, you know, people need to be religious Orthodox Jews to live here? And they said, no. They said, you can uh, live here even if you're not, even though you would not want to do a barbecue on your balcony on the Shabbat day. Meaning, you're not going to light up a fire and cook some food in the balcony on the Shabbat day. I said, that's okay. We wouldn't do it anyway, so that's fine. Uh, so we can definitely, you know. Uh, uh, but I was interviewing them and finding out more about the place. And when I began to see the plans of everything, what they're planning to do is reclaiming the Holy Basin. The basin that comprises of the Temple Mount on the west, the Mount of Olives on the east, and City of David in the middle, down below. All this is called like the Holy Basin. Now we cannot see it from here, but there are three valleys that surround Jerusalem. One of them is the Kidron Valley, which a portion of it is the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The other one is the Hell Valley, or Ben Gay Ben Hinnom, the Valley of Hell, where the, during the Canaanite period, they used to sacrifice their children to Moloch. That's across the walls of Jerusalem. And in between, there is another valley that is called the Valley of the Cheesemakers. And when you paint the topography of Jerusalem and you see the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which would be all around the Mount of Olives, when we see the topography from the air, what do we see? We see the letter Sheen. How many of you know the letter Sheen? The letter Sheen is the 21st letter of the Hebrew alphabet that has 22 letters. Letter Sheen is one before the last letter. And this letter Sheen represents El Shaddai. Now, who is El Shaddai? And so this holy basin actually leads us to the topography of Jerusalem that has the name of El Shaddai in its topography. You can see it from the air. From the air. So wh what does that tell us? It's very profound. Who is the God that revealed himself to Abraham? In Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, who is that God? El Shaddai. The one that revealed himself to Moses was yud Hey vav Hey yaveh the I Am. The one that revealed himself to Abraham is called El Shaddai. Now what is El Shaddai and who is El Shaddai? Well, we know El Shaddai is the same as Yahweh. El Shaddai is the same as Adonai. El Shaddai is the same as the God of Israel. But what aspects of El Shaddai did he want us to understand when he appeared to Abraham? Today there's a tradition that says Shaddai is an acronym. Shaddai is an acronym to Shomer Daltot Israel. means the one that keeps the gates of Israel. Kind of Psalms 121. The one that keepeth Israel shall not slumber, shall not sleep. And that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful tradition and, and a very prophetic tradition of an acronym of El Shaddai. Shaddai really comes from the word Shad. Shad is a breast of a woman's breast. Normally it would be full of milk for nursing. 
So El Shaddai would be the God that has many breasts to nurse all of his children. The multi-breasted God, kind of like Elohim presents himself as a protective, nourishing mother to Abraham. El Shaddai. Say El Shaddai. El Shaddai. I love the two explanations. Why? Because the first one, the true meaning of the word, shows me the heart of Yah for his children. Then you can understand when Yeshua comes in the book of Matthew 23 and he says, Like a mother hen that wants to gather your children, I have wanted to gather you under my wings, but you were not willing. And then it goes to say, now your house is going to be left desolate and you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, which is blessed is he that comes in the name of Adonai. So those were the last words of the Messiah concerning Jerusalem. Now we are in another time. Can you say with me another time? We are not at the time of destruction, but we are at the time of restoration. And that is where people actually make big theological mistakes. They are continuing the time of destruction as, this, as if it needs to go on this time. But this is not the time of destruction. This is the time of restoration. And this particular Jewish neighborhood in the southeast of Jerusalem is showing up as a sign of that restoration in the Holy Bas Basin between the Mount of Olives, the Temple Mount, and the City of David. That particular restoration is prophesied in Psalms 102. It says, you will arise and you will have mercy on Zion. You will arise and you will have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her has come. However, this is not a light matter because it talks to us why and how do we detect that this is the time to favor Zion. I'll tell you what it is. This is how Psalms 102 continues. It says, because your servant loves the stones of Jerusalem and the dust of the stones. So when the servant of Yah loves the stones of Jerusalem, loves the dust of the city, it is the time that's prophesied not for destruction but for restoration, the time to rebuild Zion, the time to restore Zion. I don't know, but I think that during this tour, I brought in servants of Yah. Do you consider yourself to fit the bill as a servant of El Shaddai, Adonai, Yavet Sevaot? Do you consider yourself to be a servant of the God of Israel? Well, if only three or four people consider themselves to be servants, the, the other ones are too tired to consider themselves servants. You are the sign of the restoration of Zion. You are the sign of the restoration of Zion. You are the sign of the favor to Zion. You are the sign of the rebuilding of Zion. So when people come and say, no, 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 all of this is going to be destroyed and the enemies are going to succeed, you say, you don't understand. I am the prophetic sign of the favor to Zion. We, the United Nations for Israel, are the prophetic sign for the favor of Zion, for the restoration of Zion, for the rebuilding of Zion. It, and in fact, it says in Psalms 102, for the et, now let me tell you the word et, man. et is the word for time, but time has many words in Hebrew. But in this case, in Psalms 102, et, can you say et? et? 
in the same in Ecclesiastes, for example, right? In Ecclesiastes, it says, there is a time three, chapter three, right? There is a time to be born, there is a time to die. There is a time to give birth, and there is a time to refrain from birthing. There is a time to rejoice, there is a time to grieve. There is a time for everything under the sun. Et, the word there in Ecclesiastes 3 is the word et. Et. Say et with me again. Et. What does it mean? It means the appointed time. It means an irresistible time. It means a time that you cannot overthrow this time. Because when it is time for a baby to be born, you can't push it back into the womb again. When it's come the time that you have decided you're going to be born, that's a time you are going to be born. When it's a time that you decided it's time for you to leave this earth, that's the time to die. And that's it. And you're going to go. Or fall asleep and, and you know, go to the lap of Yeshua. So what it's, when, when there is a time to mourn, there is a time to mourn. Where there's a time to laugh, there is a time to laugh. In other words, it's an appointed time. There's an appointed time for everything under the sun. And there is also an appointed time for Zion to have favor. And that's what Psalms 102 says. It says, for the appointed time to favor Zion has come because, it says, now it gives us the reason, your servants love the stones of Jerusalem and love the dust of the city. Now, I've seen you going around, and even though I know that I've made you walk up and down and back and forth and express the juice out of your muscles, tendons, ligament, and breath. But there's no better way to get to know a place but through your feet. No better way. Okay? And I know that at times me and you and all of us have been... <gasps> okay, we're going to make it up there. <laughs> Especially going up these big stairs from the Kotel all the way to the Jewish quarter. I know. You were going... <gasps> but I've also seen you in spite of it. In spite of the heat, which actually it's been quite a wonderful weather. It can be a lot hotter than this, honestly. When we were here in June, it was a lot hotter than this. This is luxury. I cannot begin to tell you how much luxury this is. Okay? So even though for some Scandinavians, especially, this is pretty hot. Maybe Wyoming, it's very hot for you too, I don't know. You can have it very hot in the summer as well and can become like desert. I don't know about Hong Kong, but Hong Kong is always hot. <laughs> and I don't know Taiwan, never been in Taiwan, but how is it in Taiwan? Hot too? It's uh, quite cool. Quite warm. Cool. cool. It's cool. Okay, so for them it's hot. So it's been hot. It's been challenging. I've had to tell you off to be punctual and be on time and let us not miss the timing and not... You know, and I've rebuked a few of you and all of that, and you've taken it very well, praise Yah. That shows me I can trust you, because you can be corrected. Powerful. You've done a lot of things. We've come to the last day of this tour. Tomorrow we're going to celebrate Simchat Torah, graduate our GRM students, and ordain some pastors, leaders. But today is the last day of your time on the land, per se, like really on tour of the land. And how profound it is that we're actually ending up here. This is where we are saying goodbye. We're saying goodbye um, very close by from the watchman apartment that is going to be here. So the shofars can be blowing over the Temple Mount and over the Mount of Olives day and night, or at least whenever the Holy Spirit shows and prayers can go up from here, and hopefully we will be able to establish a 24-7 prayer. It would be very important if we will. We will see how it will go, but we're living from our home then. I cannot invite you to the living room <laughs> yet. It hasn't been built yet. It's being built. Everything, as you can see, is being built, but I don't have any furniture there yet. 
uh, and no refrigerator to offer you some cold drinks or something like that. So I'm bringing you as close as possible to where you would come if you would come uh, to visit us personally. So actually, this, this whole tour has been intimate. It's been family. It's been getting to know Israel as Israel, getting to know us personally, me personally, our family personally, uh, the settlers of Samaria personally, the settlers at the gate of the Negev Shavei Darom personally, the settlers in Gilgal personally. Everything has been personal in this place. But I believe that it's Yah that wants to on purpose say goodbye to you from the land, from from the watchman apartment, all the way from where we are going to be located once we are either sent back to Israel or we come and go from Israel. One of the two, and where many of the trusted uni un Unify United Nations for Israel members, delegates especially, will be able to come and do prayer missions from this place. So you will be able to take it home with you. But I've seen your faces and I've seen you going around I've heard your testimonies, and I dare to say that you are those servants that Psalms 102 speaks about. I dare to say that you are the ones that love the stones of Jerusalem and love the dust of Zion. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? No, you're right. So you are the sign, the prophetic sign, that Yah is given favor to Zion. You are the prophetic Zion. And that's exactly fulfilling the scripture for the United Nations for Israel, Zechariah 2, where it says many nations will join Yahweh in that day and will become my people. The motto of the United Nations for Israel, sheep nations instead of gold nations. They will become my people. I will possess Judah. We're seeing Judah all before us. Seeing Judah, yeah? I will possess Judah as my portion in the Holy Land. Wherever we've gone, Samaria, Negev, Sharon Valley area, the Galilee. Everywhere, the Sea of Galilee, Nazareth. We have seen the people of Judah. We have seen the Jewish people. He said he will possess us in the Holy Land, which means that there's going to be a great revival here. That means many, 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 many are going to surrender to the God of Israel in full, which means accepting Yeshua, the Messiah. Not accepting, serving. For he will be the king, the Davidic king. He said, David will be their king. He will be the Davidic king. Maybe, maybe, maybe King David, resurrected King David, will be the king of Jerusalem again under the king Messiah that is ruling from Jerusalem to all the nations. I'm not discarding that possibility that David, the reason David, because you understand that David will rise from the dead. So the reason David that said that you will always have an heir on your throne may actually be the king of Jerusalem again under the king of kings and the Lord of lords that is going to be ruling the nations with the rod of iron from Jerusalem all the way to all the nations. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So I will possess Judah as my portion in the Holy Land and I will again choose Jerusalem. What did he say? I will again... What do you mean again? Why again? Because Jerusalem was destroyed. And Jerusalem was forsaken in that sense. Year 70 AD was raised to the ground. The temple was raised to the ground. And Yah said, but I will again choose Jerusalem. It will again be called Jerusalem. Not any other name but Jerusalem. Yerushalayim. And Yerushalayim means a double portion of Shalom. Also, Yerushalayim means my inheritance is Shalom. 
My inheritance is shalom. So that's why it's so important to pray for the shalom of Jerusalem, that it will be in well-being. Psalms 122, verse 6 and 7, that it will be in well-being. It's so important not to forget Jerusalem, Psalms 137, 5 and 6, when it says, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its ability, its cunning, and let my tongue cleave to the palate of my mouth, if I do not set up Jerusalem, Jerusalem as the chief of my joy. Wow. A subject of my joy. You know why? Because it is a subject of the joy of the Father. And that's the reason why he said in Isaiah 62, he says, Give me no rest, you watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem. Give me no rest until I establish and I make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Until it becomes a praise in the earth. Where every nation would say, we need to go up to Jerusalem. We need to pay homage to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's the reason why we have come this Sukkot. This Feast of Tabernacles, this Sukkot, that some people call the Feast of the Nations because in Zechariah 14, verse 16, it says, after the wrath of God, whatever surviving nations there would be, hey, maybe your stand today for your nation through the United Nations for Israel, standing for Israel where she cannot even stand for herself, will actually buy time for the repentance of your nation. It will actually buy mercy so that at least a portion of your nation can survive and so they can come up to celebrate Sukkot during the millennial reign because it says all the nations that survived need to come to Jerusalem to pay homage to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords during the Feast of Sukkot. So you and I and all of Unify represent the sign of the favor of Zion. And from this place that's called North Zion or the view of Zion, we are going to say Shalom Ulehitraot. Let's blow. Yeah. 